Michael Moreno, and I teach college writing here at American University. Thank you for being here today. I'm glad to have the opportunity for us to talk about the important topic of fostering inclusivity that extends beyond the confines of the classroom. I'd like to give credit to two of our panelists, Fanta Ah, there on the end, and Brianna Weedock right here next to me, both of whom were on a uh, related panel at last year's Amparin conference. While I didn't make it to the conference in person, I watched most of the sessions online on the university's YouTube channel, and I was especially struck by their panel discussion. I encourage all of you to uh, watch it too. Uh, they talked about how increasingly in-class discussions are doing the exact opposite of what they're intended to do. They're shutting students down. As teachers, what we want most is for our students to engage, to practice weighing in on the debates of their areas of study, and to try on different perspectives in order to come to discover their own. During that discussion, we heard from students who have been ostracized for voicing minority views. We heard from students who felt burdened to speak on behalf of their particular racial groups or political affiliations. We heard from students who wished their professors had recognized when discussions had slipped into dangerous territory and had steered them back um, into a productive lane. These students' stories, uh, they stuck with me for a couple of reasons. For one, I, like you, am responsible for my classroom environment, and I certainly don't want my students to shut down. Two, I, like those students, had many similar experiences here at AU when I was a graduate student, and I remember how alone I felt. I want something better for my students, and I presume those of you who are here do too. What else struck me during that panel discussion was how many members of the audience, the faculty members in attendance, put the student panelists on the spot. What should the professor have done, they asked. What would you have preferred, they asked, as if it were the students' jobs um, to teach the faculty. Uh, I'm sure you agree that that is not the student's job. It's our job. We have to figure this stuff out and serve our students. So here we are. Those of us on this panel are going to talk about what we do to foster inclusion, to get students talking, to give them space to share multiple perspectives, to teach them how to take the civility we demand in the classroom out into the world. And we hope you also will share what you do because we do not presume to have all the answers. After each of us talks briefly about different aspects of this topic, we're going to open the floor up for discussion. We want to hear what you do in your classroom to get students to open up. We want to hear what you do after class to keep important conversations going. We want to hear about the mistakes you've made so maybe we can avoid those same pitfalls. And of course, we will do our best to answer your questions or at least point you in the direction of resources. Speaking of resources, we will use the Blackboard Classroom dedicated to this session to post materials. If you have materials you'd like to share with the group, you're welcome to send them to me and I will post them. Um, my email address is michael.moreno at american.edu. Um, now, without further ado, I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Amanda Taylor. Um, I am honored to direct the Master's in Intercultural and International Communication program here. I teach undergrad I teach undergrad and grad classes, thank you Patrick, um, undergrad classes in cross-cultural communication where obviously this is a key um, dimension that we, we grapple with um, every day in our work. I also teach graduate courses um, along with colleagues like Fanta in globalization and education where conversations around sort of education and power and how those things are reproduced together um, oftentimes operate and are things that we engage. So thanks for being here with us. Hi, I'm Brianna Weedock. I am the Senior Academic Counselor for Undergraduate Students in the School of Public Affairs. I have also taught in the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies program, um, intro classes and the theory class. So I have a perspective of teaching difference as a um, white cis woman, um, middle class, and encouraging my students to talk about race and class dif differences um, from a perspective of privilege. Uh, hello, my name is, oh, well, 
My name is David Curtis. I'm a sophomore studying sociology with a minor in justice and law here at American University. I am a member of the Frederick Douglass Distinguished Scholars Program, as well as the AU University's Honors Program. Um, and I'm a student leader in um, American University's Black Student Alliance, as well as Chi Alpha Christian Ministries. Um, and I've been very active on campus and related to race and climate, and I'm really happy to be here today. And I just want to thank you all for your time. Good morning, Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I'm Fanta. Good morning, everyone. I'm Fanta, and I'm the Assistant Vice President of Campus Life here at American University, and I also teach in the School of International Service in the International Communications Program. Um, one of the reasons um, that I I'm participating in this is that I have the honor uh, often of hearing a lot from students about their classroom experiences and I also have a lot of interaction with faculty about what is happening in the classroom and some of the challenges that they're seeing coming up in their classes, things that they have not experienced before um, as faculty members here at American University. So I've been collecting stories is probably the best way to frame this. started, um, one of the things that I've been spending a lot of time on as I talk to faculty and also I talk to students, um, ha it has to do with really helping to debunk some of the myths about the classroom and where we are. Um, I often hear from faculty who are not particularly in the social sciences often say to me, well, you know, you're, we're having these conversations about campus climate, we're having these conversations about climate in the classroom, but I guess I'm one of those lucky faculty because I'm in a subject area where this really doesn't apply. And I immediately smile and say, well, think again, um, because it really does apply. I don't believe that there's any subject matter that is neutral when it comes to this area. And so I find myself having a lot of conversations with faculty who are in those disciplines about what is going on in the classroom. And many of them are often surprised when things go awry because we're coming into the classroom with a focus on the subject matter and not necessarily looking at how then that subject matter gets translated in terms of the classroom environment and the climate that is creating. And a lot of times the conversation also focuses on the types of case studies, perhaps that faculty intentionally or unintentionally are not incorporating within their curriculum. And so I'm, I'm finding myself having a lot more conversations about not so much what is your subject matter, but how are you in fact teaching that subject matter and what are the resources and materials that you're incorporating in your subject matter that takes into account the everyday lives of our students so that that becomes much more relevant to their learning in the classroom. So I would say that certainly is one of the myths that I think needs to be debunked, is that the issue of difficult conversations lend themselves to certain subjects and that others are exempt from it is certainly something that we need to re-examine. The second area that I also find myself in conversations with faculty a lot about has to do with this issue of, well, maybe there are ways that I can engage in getting through the subject matter because we really need to get through the semester and there's so much to cover. Maybe there's a way that I can do this um, and that they're not going to have these difficult conversations having to happen in the classroom and that we can find ways to work around that and that there's something comforting about being able to have the learning happen without the difficult conversation happening. And I'm finding that faculty are spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to work around that. Again, I think that's a myth that we have to debunk. The issue is not you know, whether or not these difficult conversations should happen. They must happen, is actually what I would argue. It's more about what is the role of the faculty member in managing those conversations productively so that learning happens and in fact it enhances the overall subject matter and not seeing it as something that could be a barrier to learning, I would say is the second um, area that needs to be debunked. And then the third has been when topics have come up that in some ways have become more heated. In the classroom, um, there's also the tendency to think, okay, well, it's happening in this space, and we will get to it next, sort of next class, whether it's next week or two weeks from now. And in some cases, they've been surprised that that conversation has overflown, has basically flown out of the classroom, and that the conversation has continued out of the classroom, and then in the next session when they've come back, they're hearing the ramification of those conversations. And one of the things that I think we all know and we all learn is that whatever happens in the classroom around these difficult conversations, know that those conversations are going to carry over. 
So it becomes important to think about not just how we manage it within the classroom, but what are ways that we can support students in their learning outside of the classroom, knowing that this is a process and an ongoing process for students. So those are three of the areas that I would like to bring up at the beginning of our conversation to say this is not value neutral. There's not really, they're not magic bullets for how we work around the difficult conversations. And how we think about space for learning needs to be in many ways expanded to think about the classroom space being expanded beyond the confine of when you're having your lecture and what happens after classes. Those are three things that I would like to, to basically um, highlight at the beginning of this conversation. And with that, I'm going to have Amanda talk about particularly the classroom climate and particularly the notion of hidden curriculum. Okay. Thanks, Fanta. Um, I think to start from a personal perspective, I began my career interested in training teachers to work in intercultural contexts, right, or educators more broadly, which is something we do in the International Communication Program. And I started out, you know, a, a white woman from the, from the East Coast of the U.S., um, a cis woman also, very well-intentioned in this work, right? I cared. That's why I was doing it, right? I care about this work. I care about justice. I care about social change. I care about education's role in that process. And I could never understand how oftentimes in classes, students would come out saying things like, you know, it didn't feel like this was a safe space, right? And I thought, how could that be possible? Hey, maybe in that class we weren't talking about race, gender, inequality, you know, social class, et cetera, in that class. How could that happen, right? What is the relationship between, A, my intentions, and the impact and the culture that students, especially historically underrepresented students, experience in the classroom, and B, the content of conversations and the experience of students as reading that as race, class, gendered, heteronormative, et cetera. Right? So, so as I started out, I began to kind of try and figure out what's going on in the communication space. Right, That's something that we think a lot about in our program. And what I want to push on is one of these myths that, that Fanta described. You know, We focus a lot in these conversations over the course of the, the, the last year, really, at AU on difficult conversations, right? how to manage them, how to deal with them, whether to bring them up or not. What I want to put forward is that we're having conversations about these issues, whether we're talking about them or not, right? Um, we're having conversations through our nonverbals, through the way we arrange our space, who we speak to, who we don't, who we offer opportunities to, who we, who we don't, um, and why. So, so I, want to, I want to put forward the idea of this notion of the hidden curriculum, um, which is a sort of academic concept, first coined in 1968 by uh, Philip Jackson, a sociologist, um, and a lot of this work has sat in, um, has sat in the kind of K-12 space, but it's increasingly becoming relevant in the higher education context, right? So the hidden curriculum is this idea of how do schools and educational institutions have a socializing function, right? Outside of the explicit subject matter of what we're talking about, that schools always are doing something else. We're always teaching about values, norms, behaviors, um, what is to be desired, what kind of life is to be desired, what kind of identities um, are valid and invalid, um, what kind of values are useful to hold or not to hold. So, so this idea of the hidden curriculum began sort of through, through functionalists, right, looking at how, how schools and universities did that and began to sort of get picked up by critical theorists and Marxists, right, and started to say, all right, how are our schools and institutions um, often implicitly, right, sometimes a little bit more intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, putting forward messaging um, to young people um, that, and to their families ab about these, these norms, values, ideas, and behaviors that are valued and not. So when we talk about hidden curriculum, we're talking about things outside of our content, right, outside of that conversation that we have or not. And it has two dimensions, this idea of hidden curriculum, right? There's the idea of hidden. Right? And I think what we mean by hidden is, is important. It's the idea that it's normalizing, naturalized, everyday, taken for granted ways that the process of things becoming normal, becoming valued, right, um, is enacted in and through school. So, so this, this can be more or less overt, very subtle, or hidden in plain sight oftentimes, obvious to some and not to others, um, both conscious and subconscious, or intentional or unintentional. And when we talk about curriculum, um, it's not necessarily the content, right? 
It's not what we teach per se, that matters of course, but it's about how we teach, it's about where we teach, and it's about by and with whom we do these things. So I think sort of an example of what the hidden curriculum is, um, the very colloquial example that we can, we can talk about really, is how do we respond in, in class discussions, whether they're about difficult conversations or not, right? And when you look at research, and again, this has typically been done in sort of kindergarten to 12 um, years. It's starting to happen in higher ed, but a lot of it I think is quite relevant. Um, research demonstrates that teachers typically respond differently to women and men when they speak out of turn in class, right? So if you've said as an instructor, um, I'm gonna present, and then if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand, or please indicate by some way. When men speak up, and speak out without being called on, without being acknowledged in some way. Um, teachers tend to allow for that. They tend to engage it and continue a conversation, right? Um, whereas with women, teachers tend to uh, discipline that. You know, you really should have raised your hand, or let's wait on that, okay? Because someone is, it, we're still gonna continue the conversation that we are having. So the hidden curriculum dimension of that, that's not in the content of the class, that can happen any time. The hidden curriculum there is obviously the message, right? That for men, it's okay and in fact may be valuable and valued to be more aggressive, be more forward, to own your own ideas. And for women, right, it's better to follow the rules, follow the norms, and be a bit more um, quiet and to listen to the teacher. So that's just a very kind of basic example of how the hidden curriculum can operate. We can extend this in all kinds of dimensions. Um, we can look at faculty offices, right? Who has an office where? What does that mean about who's in charge and who's important and valuable? I think that's something, certainly we can, we're all smiling, right? Who in SIS, for example, is in the main building and who's in the sub building on the side, right? Who's on the top and the back and the corner, right? And who's hidden among the depths of the attic, right? Um, so, so I think the hidden curriculum is how we convey messages about importance, value, identity, meaning, right? Through our everyday behaviors. So why does this matter? Right, obviously it's something nice to talk about, but I think really it's about um, you know, the ideological and material impacts of the work that we do every day without thinking about it in and through our teaching and everyday behaviors outside of classes as well. So, so you can think about you know, when faculty and staff sometimes describe not feeling welcome, what does that mean? Right? Why would someone not feel welcome? Okay, how do we understand that? Um, when someone says they feel like they can't breathe, I've heard many of our graduate students talk about that, especially historically underrepresented students. I feel like I can't breathe here. I don't like to be in this building. Um, where does that come from, right? How does the space and the way that we organize it transmit messages and meanings that students then take up as dimensions of their, their welcomeness or connectedness or not to an institution or the way that they are valued or not by, by where we are? Um, so I think it also has material impacts and this is important to recognize too. Um, it has material impacts on grading, this idea of participation, right? And who is engaged in class and who's not engaged? And how do you know that as a faculty member? How do you make those decisions? When you have your head down on a desk, right? What does that mean about engagement? How do we know, okay? Um, how do you grade a student who's never come to office hours, never written an email to you? Um, how do you make assumptions about what that means about that student? Okay, um, admissions practices are another way, right? What are our policies around admissions? How do we decide who's qualified and not? What are the criteria we're using to make those decisions, right? These are all ways that it operationalizes in really material ways for our students and students who are not then asked to be our students. Um, I think we need to think about how it, how it relates to distributing opportunity. Um, there's this notion of this book that I'm reading I wanted to bring in. Um, it's again in the K-12 context. It's called Despite the Best Intentions. How Racial Inequality Thrives in Good Schools by Amanda Lewis and John Diamond. John Diamond is, was an advisor of mine when I was doing my dissertation. And it talks a lot about this notion of opportunity hoarding. Um, so how and why do we offer people connections to our professional, especially in, in graduate school? You know, hey, let me put you in touch with one of my colleagues. They're hiring. You should do an informational interview with them. How do you make decisions about who you give those things to and who you withhold them from and why, okay? So again, the material impacts of the hidden curriculum. How do students then come to understand their value or not based on who you're distributing these things to, okay? So 
I don't want to take too much time because there's a great panel here, but I think it's important to recognize the hidden curriculum manifests in lots of ways, right? One way is in space. Um, so you can look at within educational institutions the location of the university. Where are we located in Washington, D.C.? What does that communicate? Okay. Um, the arrangement of the dorms, the halls, the buildings on campuses, the administrative faculty offices, student club spaces, classrooms, location of office hours, where are they held, who's in charge, okay? Um, you can look at the regulation of these spaces, right? Who is, in fact, who's got an administrator or some kind of barrier to access and who doesn't and why and what does that mean? You can think about that even within your classroom. Where do you sit and stand? Is there a desk between you? Who's allowed to come past it and why? Okay, what do those spatial communications convey to students in terms of messaging, in terms of power? Um, who's in charge and who's not? Um, specifically for our thinking, pedagogy um, conveys a lot of this. How we teach, not what we teach, but how we do it. How do we distribute our time? Um, how much time do we spend on what topics? Right? What do we brush over and what do we really engage in? Okay, um, how do we manage discussions? Who do we call on or not? We've talked about this. How do we respond to various comments? When do we say interesting, say more? And when do we continue on? And when do we stop people and correct them? And how are we making those choices? And what messages are, is that conveying to our students? Um, what do we accept as evidence in conversations? Is personal experience, anecdote ever, what we would call anecdote, ever considered evidence? Um, does it have to come from the readings to be evidential? Um, could it be based on uh, lived experience, traditional wisdom, okay? Ways of knowing that exist outside of academia and our traditional ways that we, that we operate here. Um, our style of teaching, lecture, Q&A, how do we do these things? How much, why? Um, and we also need to think about Elliot Eisner's notion of the null curriculum, which is what is left out, okay? So that's another dimension of the hidden curriculum. What don't we teach? And how do we deal with those things that we don't teach and talk about, whose perspectives are not represented? Um, and then more broadly, we need to think about epistemological frames, right? What ways of knowing do we lift up? What do we value? Which ones do we not value? Okay, um, how do we talk about that? And we can think about our, our material environment. What kind of symbols, images are, are operating in our classrooms and in our, in our university? So uh, I want to just say, you know, what should we do about this, right? Obviously, not all things about the hidden curriculum are bad. Sometimes we're trying to convey certain values and messages to our students. So it's not that the hidden curriculum is wrong. It's that we need to name it, recognize it, um, and engage with it. Start to say, what messages are we sending intentionally and unintentionally, and how are these related to our broader goals around justice, diversity, equality, um, access to opportunity, and inclusion, okay? It's also important for us to think about as a strategy, what do you do about this? Can you name this for your students? Can you help them navigate the hidden curriculum? Describe um, what you see, what's normal. Make the normal um, not so normal. How do we do that, right? How do we articulate those things? And also, you know, knowing that the contradictions that we see once we define the cur hidden curriculum, the contradictions between what we want to do and what we're actually doing can open up really wonderful discursive spaces in our classroom. Why is it like this? Okay, what else could we do? How could things change? So that's the possibility, I think, in this, is that naming the hidden curriculum, discussing it with our students, recognizing contradictions um, and problems within that can actually open up opportunities for change and openness and better discussions. So I'll end on that, um, but thanks so much. Um, so following, this is working. So following um, up on that, one of the things that um, can contribute or detract from all of this wonderful learning that's going on in the classroom is um, ideas of how students intellectually develop. Um, so according to the student development literature, one of the ways to promote this intellectual development, which is the name of the game, uh, uh, and to assist them to move forward in their ability to think critically and to play with multiple ideas and all of that that we want to get them to is to create this classroom atmosphere in which they feel free and encouraged to share their thoughts and opinions without the fear of attack, retribution, reprisal. Um, especially from the instructor, uh, because when you're acting as an instructor, you're an, you're an authority figure, right? Um, not only in that classroom, but also in the eyes of students in that discipline that you're representing. Um, so there's a, there's a theory of intellectual development that um, has students 
developing through a number of stages that start in this dualistic phase uh, where the students really can only understand ideas as coming from an authority that they either uh, evaluate as either good or bad information. And so it's this very dualistic idea of playing um, with ideas and um, information. And so in that instance, you know, the, the professor is the person who's either putting forward good ideas or bad ideas. Same thing with the readings and the materials. Um, in, in, so you can imagine that thinking of alternatives outside of those good and bad ideas um, is pretty limited at this, at this point in their development. In the mid-stages, they're, they're able to view multiple opinions as acceptable but logic and data and evidence remain a little less important than opinion. And so I think this is where we get into the, the anecdote, right? Well, well, here's what I, I found in my life. Um, and then in the later stages, they're able to recognize and understand the need to support the opinions and the um, life experiences that they have had with evidence from the literature to en engage in an intellectual discourse to move the conversation a little bit forward and to think critically about these things. Uh, so where a student is located in this development really impacts how they're able to wrestle with these ideas that we're putting forward and the ability to wrestle with these ideas of um, inclusion and difference and being able to see themselves, especially students who may be in a position of privilege, to be able to remove the emotional piece from that and to really critically play with that idea. What does that really mean? How can this be a little less threatening and how can I own that position of privilege while thinking about it in terms of um, larger ideas? Um, so, where this, where this, I think, plays into a lot of our con conversation today is with the ideas of cultural competency and implicit, implicit bias, um, just to operationalize cultural competence um, from uh, the standpoint of the National Education Association, they, they define cultural competence as having an awareness of one's own cultural identity having an awareness of one's own view about difference, and the ability to learn and build on varying cultural and community norms. Um, so it's not only important for the students to be able to get there, but I think that as people who are in the education field, it's very important for us to be able to develop our own cultural competency. And so to be very aware and to pay attention to what is my position in this particular moment? Um, what privilege do I have? Am I representing um, things in a way that opens this up and encourages the conversation? Um, likewise, the, the implicit bias is, in, in my experience, um, is very, difficult for students to really lean into. Um, and so one of the things that I have found is to really encourage them to understand that you're not going to get comfortable until you get uncomfortable. And then the learning can happen, right? Um, Michael shared with us this great TEDx talk um, by Brene Meyer called How to Overcome Your Biases, Walk, walk Boldly Toward Them. Um, and she, I, this, this is a tool that I plan to use uh, because it, it's a talk that really diffuses the idea of bias, which can be so value and judgment laden. And she, she puts forward the idea of bias in, in a very non-threatening way. I would encourage everybody to look at it. It's probably one of the tools that you're going to put in the blackboard. Um, so she acknowledges how we all have biases and that a bias is simply a default position that you go to when things get risky or you're unsure or you're on un, uneven footing. It's your, it's your default position, right? And we all have them. Um, and so your default position isn't necessarily bad, but you need to recognize what it is. So your default is in that risky situation, who do you trust? 
Um, who, who are you afraid of? You know, thinking about these questions. Who do you feel implicitly connected to and not connected to? Who do you run away from, um, metaphorically or physically? Um, and so when you're thinking and, and teaching about um, cultural competency and implicit bias, I think that it's really important, and I see so many people in this room who know a lot more about this than I do and definitely teach from this perspective, and ta have taught me to teach from this perspective, um, to recognize our own bias and to own that and I would say to share it with students, to share what is your position in this, in this conversation, um, where do you come from, and to really model that behavior because they're looking to professors time and time again in my office, they have told me, they're really looking to the professor for cues as to how to behave in that space. Um, and so we hold a lot of power I hold a lot of power in my office when um, I'm acting in my role as academic counselor with them. It depends on how I'm reacting to them and how I'm asking them questions, what information I'm going to get from them and what information they're going to feel comfortable sharing with me. Um, the physical space definitely makes a difference. Um, and keeping in mind where they, this particular student might be at in that phase of intellectual development. And not all of them in that room are going to be at the same phase. So I think that that's very important to recognize too and to think, okay, um, I need to bring this person along, maybe tone this one down a little bit. Um, they're, they're a little bit far advanced than um, some of the other students. Um, and then I think we're gonna hand this off to David to talk about what that looks like from a student's perspective. Hello? Okay, yeah, um, pretty, exactly what Ms. Brianna just said. Um, my role here today is pretty much to just give you a student perspective of what all these different ideas, um, how they mesh together, how they um, materialize themselves within a classroom, and what that does to a student um, or to the student body um, within and then throughout their time at university. Um, and so pretty much, I guess the first thing I, I really want to um, discuss is that um, I truly believe, and I know a lot of you who are in this room also believe that it is an added responsibility of the faculty and of professors to really have and engage in these conversations, um, and that the conversations are not going to happen, or they're not solely on the job of the student, or it's necessarily students of color, or students that have difference in who these conversations, people would assume, um, mean more to them. Um, even, I'm only a sophomore, but even in the difference between my first year and my second year, I've definitely seen and um, looked at the different stats that AU is becoming increasingly more diverse. Um, even between my years of the class that I took the first year, the class that I took the second year, I saw more students of color, more students who came from minority backgrounds, who came with different disadvantages, historical disadvantages, being present in the classrooms and obviously being able to speak from these different perspectives. And I feel like in a way, that definitely disengaged a lot of professors from being able to take uh, a, a leading position and being able to facilitate these conversations because I believe there's becoming a natural assumption, well, now that the university is become more diverse, the students in the classroom can take the job that I have away and they can kind of facilitate the conversation. And you know, it's up to them to speak up for themselves because there's more, you know, visual representation or there's more of a, there, there's, there's a, um, a higher, um, percentage of these kind of students in the classroom. Um, and so I just want to really be able to drive home the point that I don't think that it's completely fair or sensical to believe that because most students are not looking forward to engaging in controversial topics. Even students of color even students with historical disadvantage who can talk about different ideas of race and identity and privilege upwards, downwards, behind your back. And you know, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, for me as a student of color, understanding me being African American, me coming from a low income neighborhood to a school that is predominantly um, 
has a predominantly higher social class, predominantly historically racially more advantaged, I come into a classroom and there's still a strong sense of fear. Um, there's a sense of fear that I will be inevitably misunderstood, that my voice, that my beliefs, my opinions will never be validated by the types of epidemiology that professors want or require, um, that there's always some way I will be, um, my words will be devalued or discredited um, or be seen or my opinions be seen as a tangent of some kind of secret or personal problem or conflict. Um, so, and I know this is the opinion of a lot of students of color um, who, who carry a lot of this baggage. So I want you to understand that students are not looking forward to going into classrooms and having difficult conversations, um, whether it be the side of those who are more privileged, who don't understand these difficult topics or conversations, but also the students who know them all well too familiarly, you know, who, who live with this, who struggle with it, who, who identify it as a part of their personal life. So it is still a part of the professor's um, role as a facilitator, as um, as this vanguard of knowledge and as this imparter of, of truth and understanding through these disciplines to be to still facilitate these conversations, to still guard them, to still make sure that they are equitable and fair and that everyone does feel safe. Um, and the increasing amount of people of color and difference isn't going to take that job away from you. Um, and I also just going to talk about how um, these ideas of difference and these ideas of race and of color and of privilege, how a lot of professors, and kind of what Fanta Al was talking about, how a lot of professors, depending on the, di the discipline or depending on the demographics of the class, will see these type of conversations as not relevant or irrelevant. Um, but it matters to someone in your class. Um, even if it's just a few students, it matters to them and how you teach what you teach and what you decide to teach and like the L curriculum, what you decide to leave out, it matters. It shapes our ideas of how we believe we are valued at this university. It shapes our ideas of how we believe that you as a professor, you as a faculty values us and what you find about us that's worthwhile, worth exploring, worth dealing with, worth identifying with. Um, and it really shows us the type of transparency and vulnerability you want us to engage in in the classroom by how much you decide to engage or not engage in these difficult conversations. And so although a lot of professors may not find these things relevant, there's all types of, and then it's just interesting because I believe that idea and that um, the ideology that certain conversations are not needed for the classroom is becoming increasingly more um, nonsensical in the idea that classrooms are becoming more diverse, students of color are becoming more emboldened and more invigorated to be able to speak their truth, be able to identify with themselves in the context of what they're learning and what you're teaching. Um, and there has to become more of a relevancy to how you prepare and how you teach and the type of messages and illustrations you provide and what you're, and what you're teaching. Um, and so there's ways to find relevance in everything. Um, just like Dr. Fanta all said, this conversation, these type of conversations work their way back into every single facet of life. Um, even if it's not pertinent or you believe it's not pertinent to your specific subject area, I believe it really just comes down to well, what type of student are you trying to cultivate as a professor? Um, is it a student that only um, knows Arrowhead into what you've taught and to can regurgitate facts and can speak back, you know, every single lesson plan you've given, are you trying to cultivate and develop well-rounded students who are critical thinkers, who understand difference, who are prepared to be able to enter a workforce that is becoming increasingly more diverse and needs innovation and needs different ideas that have been historically underrepresented to be brought to the surface to bring about solutions to problems that we still haven't fixed. Um, and as this country and as the climate of this nation becomes increasingly more diverse and becomes increasingly more infatuated with people of difference, it does a disservice to everyone the people who are of difference and the people who are historically privileged and advantaged to not show the reality of what that looks like um, and to, to, to teach a curriculum that is coded in this very traditionalist sense of um, this higher academia, very flourished, very um, sanitized version of the world that so many people do not and will not 
um, live their lives in as they grow older. Um, and so I just really want to emphasize the importance of understanding that there is relevance in these conversations, that they are not side trackers, they are not barriers, they are not impediments, but they are the ultimate catalyst in order to produce the type of students and the type of communities um, that AU attracts its students to come to because of the values that this university promises to instill in the students and promises to give that investment, to that return on the investment that students partake in. Um, and I just feel like it's a bit idealistic, but I feel as professors, that is the goal that most of you guys, most of you all would like to come to, to see students who are well-rounded, who are engaged, who are passionate and amiable, who can speak their truth. And even if their truth is at odds with what a lot of other people believe, can be respectful and responsible and at least understand and know where other people are coming from. And I believe a big part of that happens within the classroom context and how you build a culture of the classroom. That was kind of speaking to a, um, with the other panelists. It's really important that students in the classroom get to know each other. Um, and so when these conversations happen, there's not always this sense of division and this sense of contention. Because for me personally, as a student of color, if I am not, if, if, a, if, the, if a structure of a classroom seems impersonal, I will always fall back on my own biases um, in order to how to navigate and govern the conversation. And a lot of that includes that a certain professor may not like me, a certain professor may be, I may have to work two times as hard, I may have to keep these conversations over here, I may have to defend or speak on behalf of my race. And so if these kind of myths or these kind of um, examples and behaviors are not debunked and are not, um, they're not um, deactivated within the culture of the class and through the, the guidance and the understanding and the words and the actions of the faculty and of the professor, um, people are gonna resort to their natural dispositions about how to deal with certain issues, especially in classes where these conversations of difficulty and controversy arise um, more often than not. And so I feel like if you can get students to better engage themselves, whether it be through small groups, um, breaking up in sessions, allowing them to talk about difficult conversations in a smaller setting, um, really being able to have students get to know each other, to connect, and to understand that everyone has a different opinion, but to be able to order, to, in order to be able to facilitate that in a way that is respectful, in a way that is healthy, is um, going to improve the overall culture of the class in itself, because I, um, this past semester I was involved in a, a sociology class with a professor who I believe definitely um, really was able to engage a lot of these, um, these, a lot of these strategies very successfully. Um, and at the beginning of every class, she would ask us, a part of sometimes just doing role, asking us a question um, about, it sometimes it would be about our week, sometimes it would be about favorite books, favorite candy, but a lot of times there were questions that were very centered on identity. And it was so interesting to be able to hear every single person's answer to these questions as they went around the room. And it was, it became a part of the culture and the ritual of our school, um, uh, of our class, to be able to have these conversations, to be able to answer these questions and everyone to have a fair and equitable shot at saying, you know, this is the stereotype that I hate the most. This is the biggest difficulty I've overcome in my life. These kind of things um, that a lot of professors don't seem um, applicable to the classroom, but and then again, what kind of student are you trying to cultivate? Because you only have three to four months with the student, but what you do and what you impart, um, it, it, it carries a lifetime of, of a consequence and a ramification. So just really having faculty engage students with one another and engage students one-on-one, -on -one, showing them that they care, um, being the ultimate facilitator of these difficult conversations and not allowing certain visual representations or demographics to be able to, to um, sidestep a professor or a faculty member's responsibility I think is really important. So that's all I have to say, thank you. Okay, um, so that was great, David. Um, I appreciate what all you had to say. Now, I'd like to, you guys can hear me? This is on, right? No? Hello? Okay. Um, so I want to give you uh, some of the strategies that I use uh, to go beyond the classroom, okay? Um, so we're short on time, so I'm going to try to get through it kind of quickly. But one, get to know your students. Um, David was one of my students, and I'm very happy to have gotten to know uh, David. Um, and I realize that it probably sounds like a no-brainer to some of you, but the fact of the matter is that we cannot begin to anticipate 
that is we cannot predict and plan for uh, student responses to course content and associated discussions if we don't know who our students are. Um, furthermore, as David already uh, mentioned, our students are changing. Um, the freshman class looks very different from cohorts of the past. There was a great panel discussion, again, at last year's Ann Farron Conference um, on the changing demographics here at AU. You can watch it on the YouTube channel as well. Um, those changing demographics mean that we have to educate ourselves uh, to become culturally competent to develop new approaches if we're going to connect with our students. Um, so how can we really get to know our students? And some of you might be asking, how can we find the time to really get to know our students? Um, well, I make it part of my curriculum. It starts on day one. I pair students up. I have them um, interview one another, uh, write about one another, and present to the class about one another. Um, so sure, this allows me to assess um, where they are in terms of social and uh, writing skills. But it does a lot more than that. All of us, the students and I, learn where they're from, um, what they're majoring in, what they want to do when they grow up, the music they like, the hobbies they have, um, biggest fears about the class, things like that. Um, and I take those paragraphs home and I read them, and sometimes multiple times throughout the semester as an issue comes up with a student or something that I might want you know, to dig deeper on. Um, also, I create Blackboard discussions that ask students to recall a time when uh, fill in the blank. I ask them to do in-class writing in which they reflect on their learning and writing experiences at different points um, in the semester. I ask them to write and talk about themselves all the time because that's the only way I'm going to get to know them and then evaluate whether what I'm doing is working or not. Uh, when I was a grad junk, uh, one of our uh, mentors, that's right, the term only you AU people will know. Um, one of our mentors, John Hyman, uh, said something that I continue to take very seriously. Uh, he told me, strive for 19 individual classrooms. Um, I took that to heart, maybe more than he expected, but I think it's worth uh, striving for. So the second strategy you can practice here is make yourself, make yourself available and visible. Um, I know we all have office hours, and I know some of you, unlike me, actually have offices in which you hold your uh, office hours. Well, most semesters I share a cubicle uh, with other professors. I spend most of my office hours, however, out in the Battelle atrium. Um, why there? Because that's where the students are. Um, they're hanging out with their friends, they're eating between classes, they're studying. Um, say one of my students sees me there and she remembers, oh yeah, I was going to ask you about fill in the blank. Um, that connection, that opportunity for extending our conversations beyond the classroom never would have happened if I'd been holed up in my office or cubicle. Um, a few semesters ago, I had a commuter student, a first generation, an underrepresented minority, and he showed up in that atrium almost every single day that I was there. Um, we talked about his dreams, his papers for, his, for my class, his other classes, his biology class, his, his church sermons, his political interests. We talked about whatever he wanted to talk about and whatever I thought he needed to talk about. Um, if I'd held my office hours at my cubicle or in an office, that student might have shown up twice um, to see me, but you'll never convince me that he would have shown up um, you know, twice a week for two semesters. He showed up because I showed up. Um, so now look, I know your grant's not going to get written if you're hanging out in the atrium. Uh, I know you have committee work uh, to get done, um, but if you're sincere about fostering inclusion and sincere about being a true ally, you have to make yourself available and visible. Um, if you show up, they'll show up. You have to go where they are. Um, okay. Third one that I, I'd like to toss at you guys is the wrap-up emails. And um, a couple of years ago, I started sending a weekly wrap-up email to my classes, and I can't overstate how useful uh, they are. It all started because I hated that feeling of heading into a weekend and regretting having forgotten to mention this or that. Um, there was those weeks when I wished I'd had time to use more videos or excerpts from certain texts in class. There were those times when I missed an opportunity, uh, failed to capitalize on a comment from a student. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So I started writing these lengthy wrap-up messages. I used them to repeat what I said in class. I used them to applaud student contributions that deserve recognition. Mm, you know, um, I used them to send multimedia that adds another layer to what we're talking about, like the TED Talks. Um, you know, I use them to remind students about what's expected in the coming week. I use them to correct the record. For instance, if a student gives a presentation and fails to mention something important, or if I, you know, tell them something wrong, here's my chance to offer them something and correct the record. And yes, I use them to explain why I'm disappointed and how there's still time for them to pull it together. Um, um, and let me tell you, you can tell, I can tell who's read these uh, 
rapid email, then who hasn't? So you can use them in different ways like that too, if you know what I mean. You know, drop some questions in there. Um, and, but those, of course, uh, they're not all going to read them, as you know. Um, but those that do read them, they tell me all the time how much they appreciate that and how it um, extends our discussion beyond the four walls, the classroom. And finally, <coughs> Facebook. And now, hold on. I imagine many of you use social media to stay in contact with your students, and I bet a couple of you are chuckling about how Facebook nowadays is for old people. Uh, it's true, it's true. <laughs> Sites like Snapchat and Instagram are growing in popularity with the younger demographics, and the average age of Facebook users is increasing. But I'm sure we can all accept that Facebook, along with Twitter, are used every day by professionals to promote their work, to network, to build their brands. So even though maybe my students spend their fun time on other social networks, they do appreciate that using Facebook is a marketable skill. They know that, and their family members are on it too. So, so now that that's out of the way, I'll tell you why I like Facebook for teaching and how it extends our in-class discussions. Okay, so each semester I pre-schedule about, I don't know, uh, three dozen or so Facebook posts uh, for our class, the Facebook page. Uh, these are usually things like required readings and multimedia, stuff that students have to digest before coming to class. The obvious advantage to having these required readings on Facebook is that they're far more likely to be scrolling through Facebook while sipping on a latte at Starbucks than scrolling through their syllabus. The second major advantage is that I can use it, um, like the wrap-up messages, to supplement in-class discussions, to provide context, um, to show alternate, alternate viewpoints, and to provide visuals. Again, there's that student sipping on a latte at Starbucks and wham, Professor Moreno is offering more food for thought right there in between grandma's latest post about her poodle and the BuzzFeed quiz about which Pixar character you'd be. Um, they click, they give it a thumbs up, they share things with their own uh, news feed and that relates to what we're talking about and they shape the conversation. And one more thing, I'll, one last thing I'll about the Facebook page is I still have interaction from students uh, former students no longer in my class, they're still engaged with my Facebook page, um, and that's, that's great. That's what I want. Okay. Um, I, guess I'll go down. Uh, I wonder. <laughs> uh, I am. I am not one who uses Facebook, <laughs> um, and certainly not. I'm not very much versed in social media. Um, I want to finish up with just a couple of quick things, and I want to open up the floor very quickly. In the time that I spend in my classes, and based on conversations that I have with students and with faculty, in relations to how we create an inclusive classroom, I want to talk about sometimes the most common mistakes I think we make. The first mistake that I see often happen is um, that we find ourselves now confronted with a very controversial, perhaps, topic that's coming up in the class or where students are now responding in very strong emotional ways. And we're now trying to manage it. And in trying to manage it, we figure out that we haven't set the ground rules early enough. So one major advice is that it's extremely important as you design your syllabus and as you open up your courses to really have code of conduct and ground rules that are articulated and that are clear. And it is not enough that you've articulated those in your syllabus. You actually need to take time in your first and second session to have discussions about those ground rules and also, frankly, to open the doors for students to add to those ground rules. This needs to be a shared responsibility between faculty and students. That is one of the mistakes, common mistakes that I see, is that the ground rules happens when we're in the heat of the moment, as opposed to having thought about it before, so that in fact, when we're having that conversation, we can refer back to those ground rules. That's the first piece. The second piece that I see is that when we're in the heat of the moment and students really are reacting very strongly and with strong emotions to it, it is our natural tendency to really be fearful of the emotions that are being expressed and to figure out ways to temper that as much as possible. One um, strategy that I use often is I call take five. And what that means is I literally ask students, we're having the conversation and I'm having everybody involved and I'm seeing the sort of the tone go up and down and, I'm, and I can feel the emotion in the room. I will ask students and I'll say take five. And basically it's a simple technique whereby the students will take five minutes and they will write down their thoughts. Free form, 
This is not going to be graded. This is not to be evaluated. But I need each of you to reflect on what has just happened, what you heard, and how you're feeling about that. But what would be your response to that? That gives me time for pause and to get everybody back to taking a deep breath. But what it also does is it allows everybody to participate and gives them an opportunity to react and to respond. And then after they've, they've taken the five minutes, then we begin the conversation again. I have found that every single time what it does is it allows students to be very thoughtful, much more thoughtful about what they're saying as opposed to in the heat of the moment. That's the second one that I would advise. The third thing that I would say is how we need to manage proactively the classroom. And sometimes managing proactively the classroom means that you do need to interrupt some students who are taking over or students who in many ways are taking the conversations in a way that you know has the potential to not be as productive. It's okay to interrupt students in that, in that moment. The same way that it's important to get back to, okay, we're having this conversation. Clearly, there's some very um, strong perspectives about this. What are we going to do about it? Let's get to a solution component of it. That becomes an important component of, I think, the teaching in proactively managing it. Lastly is what I call exit card. The exit card strategy is we've had a heated conversation in the classroom. Clearly, there's been a lot of investment of energy and time. I may not have handled it as best as I could, but what I will do is I will ask the students, before you leave, what wasn't talked about that was important to talk about? What is still, on, what is still silence from the conversations that we've had? What is still a strong reaction or position that you still have on this issue? And I will ask them to basically provide me that information, and it can be anonymous. And then what I will do is collect that information have the time to read it over, and what that does is help me plan for the next session how we're going to enter this conversation moving forward in the conversation. So I raise these to say there are a couple of things that, you know, based on our conversations here, that I think we need to ask ourselves. The first and foremost important one is, what is the hidden curriculum in your classes? And can you name them? And in naming them, can you confront those and have a conversation with your students about those? The second part about this is none of us came into teaching with expertise in teaching unless you've been in a teacher's program. We came with expertise in our subject matter. And what I think that has done is for students, they come in understanding that we're coming in with the expertise in subject matter. But how we transfer that subject matter knowledge really matters in terms of being able to, in terms of how we make this relevant for the students. And part of that has to do with the examples that we allow our students to bring in. And then lastly, I hear this constantly from students and faculty. They're very concerned that students are very high on opinion and not strong on facts. And how they're striking the balance between the facts and the opinions. What I've often said to faculty is, it's important to define to students what are facts and what are opinions. But in doing so, you have to be cautious to not dismiss opinions. I, because there's such a tendency to want to say, well, what is you to stay with the facts, stay with the facts. But the students are telling you something when they're expressing those opinions. So that's another thing that I think we need to be able to balance as we think about the inclusive classroom that we've talked about. And frankly, what we've talked about here, it's not about how do we do this because our classes are more diverse. It's really how do we do this in terms of just best, in terms of best practices in teaching period. Whether we have you know, more students of color in our classes, whether we have more men or women, it's really more about the fundamentals of those. And those are some of the things that I would just leave you with. And so with that said, we're going to take just, and we know we're close to time, we're going to take a few questions. Um, but then also I will ask that um, she distribute uh, you know, some additional forms. And what I'm going to ask you to do, going back to the exit card, modeling the exit card system, because of the amount of time that we have here, every single one of you have dealt with these situations and you have tremendous knowledge and wisdom to bring to this. And so I will also ask you one thing in leaving. If you have used a technique in your classes to engage in difficult conversation that you have found to be valuable, would you mind noting it down on that piece of paper? And we will collect that because if we can compile a list of what has been some of the practices in this room, that will be very helpful so that we can share with others because every single one of us have used techniques that have worked and it would be helpful to have you share 
one that you've used that you felt has been particularly helpful and has been impactful. But with that, let's have some questions or comments, and then please, before you leave, if you have strategies, share that. Yes. The, the setup. Sorry about the setup. That's okay. Uh, so something interesting that people have talked about to me just in the last semester is my students' fixation on trigger warnings. Yes. So we, I'm happy to have these conversations. I do have these conversations. I teach the college writing seminar. I have either 16 or some classes or 19 and others. We do a lot of these strategies, so I can thank them for continuing to reinforce those and David. And, and I'll leave the rest of the group here in this room to also respond to it. Um, there's the same way that there were a number of students who were upset about the Senate resolution. There were also a number of students who were pleased that that was not the case. So I want to clear the record because I had a lot of students who said, thank goodness that you know we don't have that as well. So it was really, we had, we had the spectrum. Um, two things I will say here in this room, and yesterday I was just talking to a faculty member who wanted to consult as he was putting together his syllabus. They were going to, he was going to have a lot of uh, films and others that were going to be extremely controversial. And he wanted to talk about how to kind of frame some of the, the expectations in his syllabus, and we talked about it. One of the things that I'm very clear with students about, it is my role as a faculty member to create a safe classroom. It is not my responsibility to create a comfortable classroom. There's, for me, a difference between safe and comfortable. And I'm one who deeply believes that there's tremendous learning that comes from discomfort. But it's how you manage the learning that happens that is the role and responsibility of the faculty. So I'm very transparent with students when we first start the classroom about there are certain things that you're going to expect in this classroom. And I talk about what you will not perhaps experience. And comfort is now going to be one of those. And so that's where, again, going back to the ground rules and the kind of code of conduct, those are some of the things that would need to be teased out as to what will be the reaction or what will be the response when you're going to have these situations that come up and where the, the notion of sort of the trigger warning piece comes up. But that's just one of my just take away from it. Because I think we are not having enough conversations with our students about what we mean by safe and comfortable. And students are equating that. And I think we set ourselves up as a result of that for more problems along the way. <laughs>